Well, hello, Dr. Ernest J. Grant. I am happy to have you come visit and speak with us for a little while about your work and have the opportunity to talk a little bit about medical issues here in North Carolina and what it means to be black people involved in the medical industry. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. So I'm going to start since we are at Historic Shaw University in beautiful Raleigh, North Carolina, and I am the Dean of Art Sciences and Humanities, so I have to give a little yes. shout out to the institution with the idea of Leonard Medical School. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to start there because in 1882, Shaw University made history. Mm -hmm. We were the first institution to have a four-year medical college, medical university, in the whole country. Mm -hmm. So we even were before Harvard. Yes. <laughs> and I think it's important for folk to know the uh, possibilities and that as people thought, what is it that we need? Who do we, what do we need to do? They were able to do something like a Leonard Medical School, which also had a pharmacy school at one time mm -hmm. and a law mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to think a little bit about Leonard Medical mm -hmm. School in terms of the people who graduated, some of the people that we know are important factors in um, bringing medicine to black communities. Mm -hmm. We have um, Dr. Aaron McDuffie Moore, who becomes famous later on as one of the co-founders of North Carolina Mutual mm -hmm. Insurance Company, and that's in Durham. Mm -hmm. And we won't only be located in Durham because medicine and medical factors, I'm thinking about the ways in which across the whole 100 counties, mm -hmm we had different aspects of medical practice. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to my question with you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start off with, tell us a little bit about what sparked your interest in medicine or in health. Mm -hmm. And we'll start there and then we'll go on to some other okay, questions. Okay, it's a great question. Um, I, when I attended high school, um, I, my life ambition, uh, as I tell folks, was to be uh, an anesthesiologist and to drive a lime green 1968 Cougar <laughs> with a red interior. <laughs> uh, I know. It's just something about that car. I, I had one as a little matchbox car and I just fell deeply in love with it. Um, but I, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina in a little small town called Swannanoa. Um, and um, I'm the youngest of seven kids. Um, my father died when I was five, so my mother raised seven children by, her, by herself. Mm. And in speaking with my high school guidance counselor uh, about you know, my ambition in life to go to medical school and become an anesthesiologist, he suggested that you know, whereas you have the grades and you could probably get scholarships to go through undergraduate school, but you would need you know, more scholarships you know, to go on to medical school. And of course, uh, at that time, we're talking the mid-70s, uh, you know, money was not as uh, available as it is today. And so recognizing that that would probably have a, a very hard time with that, he suggested, you know, have you ever thought about nursing? And he said, you know, because you could go to uh, nursing school and become a nurse anesthetist. And then if you still wanted to go to medical school, you could work your way through med school as a nurse anesthetist. And I thought, well, that you know, sounds you know, sort of plausible. <laughs> and he said, but you may not like nursing. So uh, you know, the local community college, or at that time it was called a technical institute, to show you <laughs> how, how long ago it was, uh, he suggested um, you know, they have a one-year and two-year nursing program. So why don't you try the one-year nursing program? And if that works, then you can easily just transition over into the second year. And, you know, get uh, an associate degree, and then it will take you a little bit longer, but, you know, but you would, uh, you know, be on the, the path. So I said, okay. And about six months into the one-year program, I totally forgot all about medical school. Uh, mm -hmm. I realized that nursing was my calling, and, um, you know, and has been ever since. Here we are about 44 years <laughs> later. Uh, I have never regretted uh, choosing the nursing profession. 
um, you know, every day, uh, even though that I'm away from the bedside now and in my current position, I can still ask myself the question that I would ask myself every day, and that is, did you make a difference in someone's life today? And by being able to truly answer that with a yes, uh, just reaffirms to me personally that I made the right decision. So first of all, um, tell me a little bit more about that um, initial interest in terms of the community college that you were attending. Mm -hmm. Now we call them community, community college, college. Yes. but the technical school, because mm -hmm. first give us the name of the technical it was school. Ashley Buckham Tech, uh, which is now Ashley Buckham Community College. And who got you hooked onto the nursing? I mean, you said you left medical school behind, so yeah. was there any particular instructor that really sticks out in your mind? Uh, there were instructors as well, and, and that's, uh, I think I had a unique um, situation in that I maintained contact with the faculty, even today, <laughs> you know, 40 some years unique. later, uh, even though, you know, obviously my instructors have, you know, most of them have retired, but uh, I still maintain contact with the school occasionally. Um, and then also, the other thing that st stands out in my mind too was the little small community that I grew up in. There were, you know, a few black nurses, you know, who were there that, you know, you saw them doing things. Uh, you know, like going into the community t uh, for to the older uh, people's homes, and they were not only you know providing health care, but they would go in and you know like clean their homes, maybe cook a meal for them, or you know things that we think um, public health nurses you know would do. And you didn't just care for the one person; you cared for the whole family. And uh, you know that left an impression on me as well. The uh, you know that you know the people that you worshipped with, just watching what they did you know, during their free time, uh, you know, the, the work that they did in the community during their free time, it just sort of, you know, stuck to you, um, you know, and I, I guess, you know, there's the old uh, saying, bring up a child in the way they should go and they won't depart, you know, because my mother, even though she was not a nurse, you know, she was that way as well, you know, she firmly believed in, you know, taking care of the elders, seeing how, you know, that they were, uh, you know, that their needs were met, that they had enough food and, you know, or that their, you know, if their homes needed cleaning or whatever, you know, you would do that. And it just, you know, left an impression and you just felt really good about, you know, being able to help your fellow man. So caring became um, a, an important part oh, yeah. of how you understood yourself as yeah. a nurse. Absolutely. Now, the big um, question <laughs> that we have, so we'll go ahead and get it out of the mm -hmm. way. You are a male, mm -hmm. as obviously. Yes. You are not a small male either. No. <laughs> How is it that you resisted some of the um, ideas or stereotypes people had about who a nurse should be, and especially mm -hmm. being a larger black man, mm -hmm. what you really should have been doing with your life? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I'll expound on that. I'm, I'm actually six foot six. <laughs> <laughs> I realize that I, I uh, uh, present as a very imposing you know, individual. Um, and I would uh, run across people, you know how they say you never get a chance to make a, you know, uh, another first impression. So uh, I think immediately people would you know, sometimes look at me, uh, you know, realize you know, how tall I was, you know, how dark my skin may have been, and et cetera, and automatically develop these perceived notions that, oh, he's going to hurt me or, you know, or, you know various things like that when actually I'm a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> I think once people got to know me and know, uh, you know, what I was capable of doing, um, you know, I had to earn their trust, so to speak, and usually I could do that within, you know, like the first couple of minutes or so of, of meeting someone. Uh, I would have patients who would uh, request that I care for them uh, you know, because they would say, well, you know, you provided care for me with no pain or a little pain or, or whatever, or just the attentiveness that you were able to, to give to them. Uh, but yes, to go back to your original question, it was quite a challenge and you did have to, uh, I felt that I did have to prove myself worthy and to do, even though, you know, nursing being a female dominated profession, you know, still is, um, uh, but being a double minority, i.e. an African-American <laughs> and a male, uh, you had to really you know, essentially fight for your, you know, for your right to be where you, you know, where you are, uh, you know, and to do the exact same thing that your female counterparts, be they, you know, white or African-American or other ethnicity, that you could still do the same thing. 
uh, you know, we all took the same nursing courses. Um, so that means we were capable of doing the same thing. Uh, I think one of the things that I personally had to constantly remind my female counterparts was that I was not to be used as an orderly or the, you know, the term that was used then. Uh, or, uh, or nowadays would be like a, a, a nursing assistant, and that's not to be, belittle those two roles. Right. But growing up in the you know the mid you know 70s and 80s, you know you still had orderlies who were male uh, nursing assistants who would do like the heavy lifting, uh, or would do the catheterizations of male patients, or you know shave the male patients and things like that. And sometimes my female colleagues would come to me and ask, "Could you help?" Uh, you know, help me get so and so into the chair or whatever, and you know, I, and I would say, sure, I you know, I, I don't mind, but what would you do if I wasn't here today? Exactly. You know, uh, you know, to get them to think that you know, I am not you know here to be your, you know, your muscle boy, you know, so to speak, <laughs> to you know, to, to lift patients into bed or out of or back into bed, and I mean, we'd have some pretty heavy patients as well. It wasn't that I didn't mind that; I just wanted them to to think of me as. I'm, I am on your same level uh, playing field, and uh, you know if I wasn't here, then you know how would you achieve the same task that you need to achieve today? So um, you know, and after a while, that got a lot of them to you know to start thinking and earn their respect as well. And then pretty soon, they would begin to, um, I guess, look out for me, <laughs> you know, and say, don't treat him like that. He's not a, you know, he's not an orderly. He's not a nursing assistant. You know, he is a nurse and, you know, and should be treated as such. So tell me how you made your way from Asheville mm -hmm. and um, where you were in the mountains mm -hmm. to North Carolina Central University. Okay. What led you there? Well, one of the things that, uh, you know, you, you talked about, uh, you know, the, the aspect of caring. Uh, and, you know, which is obviously, that's what nursing is. I mean, that's, you know, about 85% of nursing is caring and advocating and et cetera. Um, you know, when I went to AB Tech, um, you know, the one year program that I graduated from, you graduated as a licensed practical nurse, not as a registered nurse, but as a licensed practical nurse. And I wanted to be able to do more for my patients than what the defined role of the uh, LPN was at that time. So as soon as I graduated from AB Tech, I started taking courses towards my bachelor's degree uh, at uh, Western Carolina University in the mountains of, you know, of North Carolina. But um, <clears throat> I wanted to be able to, to uh, do more. And uh, I was a member of a organization called the North Carolina JCs, which is a you know, civic organization. Mm -hmm. And the JCs happened to um, have a lot of state projects, of which one was the Burn Center. And I chaired a program for my local uh, JC chapter in Swannanoa, and, uh, which was to raise money for the Burn Center. Came down, took a tour, fell madly in love with the place, and decided to transfer from Western Carolina to North Carolina Central because I wanted to work at the burn center. And <coughs> so when I, oh, that's no problem. So when I came here, um, it turns out, and I was looking for a job, um, the only place that still used uh, licensed practical nurses in the ICU, the burn center was one of the places. So I figured, ah, oh. what better place to, <laughs> to work at than a place that you, you know, you're committed to, you're raising funds for. And uh, so I uh, did that uh, with the anticipation that I was just going to do that while I was uh, completing my baccalaureate degree and then would return back to the mountains. Well, you know, again, uh, 36 and a half years later, <laughs> you know, I retired from, uh, you know, from the uh, burn center and uh, again, never regretted uh, a day, uh, you know, having worked there. It's, uh, it, you know, still made a difference every day, still was invigorated every day, was, uh, you know, it was a very challenging position, but it's one that, uh, you know, I. I, I grew from and was able to, uh, you know, to really grow and apply my skills on a daily basis. I can only imagine that's probably one of the kind of tougher duty stations mm -hmm. is the burn unit. I mean, there's... It is. Uh, one of the things that I would tell students, if you want to be challenged and apply everything you learn in nursing school, because one of the unique things about the burn center is that we uh, took care of patients from pediatrics through geriatrics. 
So you had to know everything, uh, you know. And of course, in addition to the fact that the person was burned, they may also have other, you know, health concerns, uh, you know, that they brought in, mm -hmm. you know, with them. Uh, so you had to not only address their burns, but also any other uh, uh, pre-existing health conditions or family dynamics, you know, that may have been there also. So in talking with you, um, I'm finding it very interesting, kind of the arc of your career mm -hmm. and the different steps you've taken. And I know that um, we're doing a kind of a chronology. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you about your next kind of level of mm -hmm. education. I mean, mm -hmm. what made you decide that you wanted, wanted, the to, wanted to get the master's and then on, and then on to the doctorate? To the doctorate. Well, the, uh, again, wanting to be able to do more for, for my patients, you know, for the people that I cared for. Uh, the particular role, you know, nursing is is more than just you know being at the bedside. I mean, obviously that's a that's a huge part of it, but another part of it is, as I you know sort of mentioned earlier, is advocating on behalf of you know the uh, the people that you're caring for, and part of that advocacy is to ensure that people have you know good health care, good access to health care, and. Obviously, a lot of the patients that uh, that I would take care of in the, the the burn center, you know, they were from you know uh, you know economically challenged communities, and so you begin to you know to recognize that you know this shouldn't be this way, you know, that there should be that level playing field again that you know that I had mentioned, and so um, you know after getting my baccalaureate degree, probably about two weeks before I was due to graduate. A friend of mine came to me and said, you know, if you consider yourself the professional nurse, you need to join your professional association. And, uh, you know, I said, well, I already planned to do that. And she says, no, but you not only need to join, you need to be actively involved. It's one thing to have your names on the roll. It's another thing to be actively involved. And I took those words to heart, you know, and as soon as I, I joined, you know, I realized that I could, you know, apply the two and become uh, more involved, um, you know, from a policy perspective, so to speak, and advocate for, you know, uh, increased ac access to health care and, and betterment of health care and making sure that, you know, uh, people around the great state of North Carolina, you know, at that time I had become the director of the uh, prevention program. So I viewed my job as putting my colleagues out of work. In, in other <laughs> words, you know, if nobody was getting burned, then I was doing my job. And, uh, and part of that was, you know, obviously taking the legislative route, ensuring that there were uh, laws or bills that were passed to ensure that, uh, you know, we provided passive safety as well as, you know, obviously the, you know, the typical things we do in the schools, go and teach kids about stop, drop, and roll and things of this <laughs> sort. But, but, you know, the main thing is trying to get the adults to learn that you need to replace the battery in your smoke alarm or, you know, make sure your hot water heater is set at a certain temperature. And by having that written into law, uh, you know, you're providing, you know, safety. So again, I still saw that as advocating for my patients, even though you don't see it as hands-on physical, but it's providing that passive uh, prevention that would also keep them out of the hospital, you know, as a result of knowing that, hey, I've got a working smoke alarm. If a fire broke out, you know, I have that early warning device that gives me, uh, you know, an opportunity to get out because I can always replace my house. I can't replace, you know, my, my person, my family, uh, you know, and, and would go from there. And then exactly. for the doctorate, because I became, you know, very busy both at the national <laughs> and uh, and you know, state and national level. what was the association level. that you joined? The North Carolina Nurses Association, sorry. Uh, okay. you know, and as well as the American Nurses Association. So getting involved also because I began to realize that decisions that are made at the federal level or here at the state level also would affect my ability as a nurse to practice. And a lot of those decisions sometimes are being made by people who have no idea what it is to be a nurse or what it is that a nurse does, um, you know, and so they're making decisions that will affect my ability to practice and subsequently affect my ability to care for the patients, you know, the people that they're representing. And uh, so uh, became, uh, became very involved, you know, uh, you know from an uh, advocacy perspective and policy perspective of, uh, you know, uh, working with uh, members of you know, the legislature, not only here in North Carolina, but also at the federal level, you know, to get them to see that 
when a piece of legislation comes up that affects health or health care, uh, you know, this is how it's going to affect the people that you are representing. And, you know, to give them the full uh, aspect of things and not just the one-sided view that perhaps a, a lobbyist may want them to see because it's going to be beneficial for, you know, a, a certain organization or a company or, you know, something like that. But for them to have the full picture so when they do make that decision, they know that it's a very sound decision that they've made. As you're talking, um, I'm reflecting on the fact that nursing is um, a lot broader mm -hmm. and deeper mm -hmm. than what we typically um, are exposed to. Yes. I mean, we'll have our personal experiences, but I don't think that um, many folks grasp mm -hmm. how, yeah. how much nursing um, influences Mm -hmm. our whole lives, yes. not just, yeah. you know, a piece of it. Yeah, we say nursing is there from cradle to grave <laughs> <laughs> and that we are everywhere and we are. You know, it's not, uh, it's not that we're just, you know, when you ask the average person what it is that a nurse does, they may or may not know or they say, well, I know I have a friend who works at, you know, at you know, a, a local health care facility, but they don't think that uh, nurses are not only at your, your local hospital, but they're in long-term care that we are an industry, that we are in education, that we are in research, that we are rocket scientists, you know, they you know, participate <laughs> in, you know, helping to get man on the moon and, you know, and, you know, things of this sort, that nurses are entrepreneurs, that they are inventors, um, you know, they run their own businesses, uh, you know, things like that. So nurses are, are everywhere. And then the, the one thing I would encourage, you know, uh, listeners uh, of this uh, interview to, to realize is that nurses are in your community. So what, if, what affects your community also affects that nurse and his or her family. And so you'll see a lot of nurses addressing what we call these social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. You know, making sure that there's good clean water and air and that there's access to, um, uh, you know, a good grocery store and not the, you know, the uh, local, you know, Dollar General or, <laughs> you know, or, or cheap stores that, you know, they, they play a critical role but they do not provide you with good choices, particularly in the black and brown community, you know, because you, you don't get the opportunity to choose fresh vegetables or the opportunity to, um, uh, uh, to compare prices and et cetera. You know, and a lot of foods that they sell, if you've got heart disease or kidney disease, they're very high in sodium or potassium and et cetera. And people buy them because mm -hmm. obviously it stretches their dollar, but they need to be educated that, okay, even if they sell these, read the label, you know, so that you're, you know, making sure, you know, how much sodium is in this can of tuna that I'm buying or, or uh, that may be in, um, you know, this can of spam. You know, sure, it may be a, a dollar, but is it really worth it, you know, considering the, uh, you know, potential long-term effects that it may have? So by advocating in the community that, you know, let's get a grocery store in here, let's get a drug store in here so that people don't have to take you know, three and four bus stops to, you know, to get their, uh, you know, their medications, uh, you know, that's what nurses do. And, you know, that's how we are in the community. Now, one of the things that um, I was reading about earlier in terms of the American Nurses Association mm -hmm. was some of the tensions, mm -hmm. not only along gender lines, mm -hmm. but also along race lines. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to address some of those tensions that are that have always been a part mm -hmm. of our society, mm -hmm. but are now, you know, popping up again, rearing yeah. their heads. Mm -hmm. Well, to, um, let me start out by saying, you know, the COVID epidemic has shown the light on a, <laughs> a lot of inequities, uh, particularly, uh, you know, the health, uh, health and healthcare inequities in the black and brown communities. Um, and of course, there's a lot of you know social justice or injustice, uh, you might say, issues also that have you know come along with that. Um, so, with a combination of what's happened as a result of COVID and what's happened as a result of a lot of social injustice, particularly the murder of George Floyd and other you know black and brown people around the country, um, the American Nurses Association, our board of directors, issued a social justice statement. And they wanted to put some teeth behind it, you know, not just, you know, giving you know lip service, but they actually wanted to say we want to make a difference. And one of the things that we're doing is we are addressing racism 
within the nursing profession. Uh, I have recently um, uh, formed a commission to address racism in nursing. We have invited, uh, there are 18 different minority nursing groups that are at the table that we will be working on this. Uh, so it's not just you know, uh, the National Black Nurses Association, but this is Hispanic nursing, it's Asian Pacific Islanders, it's Native Americans, you know, the list goes on and on. But we have all made a commitment to try to address you know, racism within the profession. The very first meeting I mentioned to them that we really can't have a true impact until we look at our past and address that as well. We've got to clean our own house. ANA has a, uh, you know, a past history mm -hmm. of denying uh, admission to uh, black nurses in the you know, 30s, 40s, and 50s, you know, early, uh, early 50s. Um, you know, and actually, these minority nursing organizations, they uh, are the result, actually, of ANAs on racism at that time, uh, you know, because, uh, because they figure if we can't become a member of ANA, we'll start our own association. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so what we are doing with this commission, we are addressing those, uh, those issues. And ANA itself, we uh, internally have started uh, sort of a truth and reconciliation you know, mini commission as well, to look back at our history, look back at our archives of you know, meetings of our uh, membership assembly or house of delegates and you know, what does it say about that. We're also interviewing nurses who were denied. You know, there are some oh. nurses who are still alive, they're in their late 80s, uh, 80s and 90s now, but they're very sharp mind. So we're gonna interview them as well because I feel it's important to not only have um, the written documentation, but to actually hear it from somebody who you know, was maybe 20 years old in you know, 19, you know, 1940 and to hear what they, you know, how they were impacted by the, uh, the fact that they knew that they could not be, they were a nurse, but in, in essence, they were being denied that professional recognition by their own professional organization. I think it's important to have you know, their words on the record as well and anything else that we may have. So, um, so we are going to uh, you know, be looking at that and we'll be issuing a, uh, you know, a, a statement regarding our, um, you know, uh, the discrimination that we you know, practiced back then. Uh, I was telling someone I, I thought it was ironic, though, that me being, you know, the president of ANA, uh, that is, it's a black man who's apologizing for the, <laughs> you know, for what happened in the past. But it's never too late. It's got to start somewhere, and you can't expect to change the profession until you yourself, you know, address what has happened in your past, and you know, and let's move forward from that. So, uh, you know, the, the commission has. We just only have had one meeting. Uh, we realize it's going to be uh, a long uh, road to travel. There are going to be some wounds that are going to have to open up, but I think that's a necessary thing to before we can get to the other side and say that we have uh, put forth a, a document that hopefully will be addressed and adopted by accrediting agencies and we'll, we'll have some teeth. Thank you for that, mm -hmm. that fulsome answer because mm -hmm. I think it's important to talk about this yes it is and to give it the time that we need mm -hmm. to in order to air your past yes the past mm -hmm. of your organization mm -hmm. but also it gives it points to a future mm -hmm. and where is it that you would like to go yes and speaking of future how do you get young people engaged across north carolina mm -hmm. in the field of nursing what Oh, <laughs> great question, your... and I use uh, you know a, a number of different <coughs> different methods. I, I I tell them that it um, you know first of all it, it starts at a very early age. We need to start uh, getting those fourth and fifth graders, mm. and I actually participate uh, another organization that I belong to, uh, Kaidafi, which is a uh, it's, it's a nursing sorority, but it's more of a uh, service sorority. It's not like a sorority what you would think of as not you know, the like, divine not, not, not the deltas, not yeah, yeah, etc. But With the AKA. but an AKA. Yes, I have a niece who's, a, who's an AKA. But it's not that. But it's it's more of a, a service uh, sorority that uh, admit male members. Again, another historical <laughs> uh, occurrence as well. But we there is a school that uh, my particular chapter has. Uh, 
adopt it. And we go in and work with kids. And so they can see, you know, if this six foot six, you know, black guy can be a nurse, <laughs> then what kind of impression will that make on a young, you know, black or brown male who may be sitting in the, you know, in that class as well, thinking that, hey, maybe I want to consider nursing. And, you know, and we tell them, you know, you, you still need to take those um, uh, STEM courses, you know, because you've got to be smart in science. You know, as a, a, a nurse is a, a scientist who is really thinking outside the box because you always have to be thinking one or two or three steps ahead to ensure, you know, to, to stay on top of what's going on with this patient or how might we meet these needs and things that may be popping up. So the same courses that someone who's going into engineering, who's going into chemistry, who's going into, you know, some other uh, science or whatever, uh, nurses have to take those courses as well and apply that in their, you know, their clinical setting. So setting that example there to, you know, to, uh, you know, put that in their, their mindset that if you want to be a nurse, here are some courses that you need to start taking now while you're in the fourth and fifth grade and continue to build on those as you, you know, get into high school and on into uh, to, to college. So by setting that example, that's one way. Another way is, of course, uh, you know, as I sort of implied earlier, the community presence of, of nurses, you know, uh, nurses being there. So like the, uh, the nurses who went to the church that I, you know, that I grew up in, uh, you know, making their presence known, we can do the same either, you know, in your, you know, at your local church or, or synagogue or, you know, house of worship or being active within the community. That means maybe serving on you know, boards that maybe not necessarily are health related, but, you know, serving on the, you know, PTA mm -hmm. or serving on a, you know, city council or whatever else, or just being an advocate. Like I said, holding city council accountable. You know, if you said you're going to clean up this, you know, this swamp over here, why haven't you done it? Or, you know, if you said you're going to get a grocery store into this food desert area, why hasn't that been accounted, uh, you know, accounted for? Holding them accountable that way so that people can actually see that this is still nursing. It may not be that you're taking care of the person at the bedside, but the fact that you're giving them better choices so that they can make healthy decisions, uh, you know, that, you know, choosing the right uh, foods that go along with whatever health conditions that they may have, mm. uh, you know, is just as important as taking care of them when they failed to do that, and now it's put them in the hospital to where they, you know, that they can't, uh, you know, uh, provide, you know, for their family and et cetera. So those are some of the, you know, just a couple of ways that uh, you can get young people interested in the profession. Oh, thank you. I have a um, couple more questions. Sure. Um, if you've got. Oh yes, plenty of time. The time, great. <laughs> One of the things you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. was the um, interaction between the federal the mm -hmm. government and the state government. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about the relationship that the nursing associations have mm -hmm. with our health and human services? Um, the Department of Health and so, Human Services is this entity. Mm -hmm. So how do you all interact and what are some of the th ways in which you participate in okay. activities Well, here at the, the, the state level, mm -hmm. uh, I know that the North Carolina Nurses Association does uh, a lot of surveys like, well, let's take the, you know, the, the COVID pandemic that's going on now. One of the things that was heard and continues to be heard when COVID first came to our shores, particularly among healthcare providers, was the lack of personal protective equipment. You know, the, the mask, the, the gowns, the gloves, and et cetera. Um, so North Carolina Nurses Association, just like uh, ANA, uh, we do, you know, every other month we'll do what we call pulse surveys of nurses. You know, do you have enough uh, PPEs? Do you feel comfortable uh, with reusing the, you know, the PPEs that uh, you know, your facility says that you have to use and et cetera? So we can take that information, that survey results, give that to the folks at, uh, you know, HHS and say, you know, in this part of the state, there still seems to be a supply shortage of PPE, uh, you know, and it's all about safety and, you know, obviously trying to reduce the transmission of this virus. So Health and Human Services can now take that information and as they are planning, uh, you know, they can say, we need to get more, uh, more masks to, you know, to this underserved area here. And we need to make certain that, uh, you know, there's a, a, a enough supply there. 
or with the, uh, the vaccine clinics that are going on now. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're seeing as a result of that is that now there's a glove shortage because obviously you're using you know, uh, more gloves than what you, you normally would. So again, uh, Health and Human Services, as they are planning uh, you know, where we're going to put up clinics and et cetera, do we have enough supplies to, you know, to meet the needs of the people who are volunteering to serve, um, you know, to administer these vaccines and et cetera? Do we have enough supplies to ensure that they are safe uh, as well as, you know, the fact that they're, they're going to be giving these injections to, uh, you know, the people in the communities? We can also be on those, uh, those committees where they're making the decisions about, well, we're gonna hold a clinic here in Southeast Raleigh. Well, having a nurse there who knows the community, mm. they may say, well, that's not a good idea because we lack this resource, that resource, et cetera. Or if you're gonna hold it there, we need to make sure that we have those, you know, those resources. Um, or maybe consider, you know, where do you want to, to host it? Host it at a community center or a church or a synagogue or, or whatever, so that uh, people can easily come to that. You don't want to make it to where someone has to get on two or three city buses right. in order to, you know, uh, to get that vaccine. If we hold it right in the community, it's almost like bringing Mohammed, you know, the mountain to Mohammed, so to speak, <laughs> as, as opposed to the, the other way around. But a nurse can say, you know, uh, we don't have enough resources there, or maybe we do, and maybe this church here, they have a church bus or a church van that maybe we can get the word out to their members and say, okay, they're gonna, there's gonna be a vaccination clinic here. Anyone who would like to participate, you know, we'll send the van out to pick you up. And, you know, obviously practicing, you know, social distancing and et cetera. But it's a way for that person who otherwise may not have had the opportunity to get vaccinated, you know, you're coordinating that. And by letting that uh, religious leader know that, hey, we're gonna be doing a you know, vaccine clinic right next door. You know, do you have some senior people within your congregation that you know that may have a difficult time doing this? Well, you know, you know send your church bus to their home, get them, bring them here, and you know, we can vaccinate them and, and then you can uh, take them back. So that's a you know, pretty good example of how we can, uh, you know, uh, how nurses can have that, uh, that input in, uh, you know, at the state level, you know, working with uh, HHS and at the national level, the, the same thing. My job at the national level, I have been uh, given testimony before various committees uh, within Congress, again, to paint the picture of what's going on across the United States. You know, I interact with, um, you know, with all 50 states plus the territories, you know, the nursing organizations there. And I have 20 nurses that I speak with just on a one-on-one -on -one basis who are on the front line to get a pulse of what's going on and, you know, and they're all over the, the country. So again, I can relay that information to members of Congress and say, you know, no, we still are not meeting the PPE requirements that, you know, that are needed or there's, uh, you know, this may be going on and that may be going on and, you know, or, you know, here's some ways to potentially address that. So that it's a coordinated effort and they rely on the information that we're feeding them so that they can put things in place to make sure that there are no, um, you know, uh, huge, uh, uh, I guess, snafus or, you know, whatever that may be occurring. So you um, brought up the issue of vac vaccination, mm -hmm. vaccinations, <clears throat> vaccines. Yeah. What, um, are there any particular um, statements that as a, an association you y'all are making mm -hmm. to um encourage people yes to get the vaccine to, to get the vaccine yes and how do you message for the different kind of different community yeah well the, the the main message is that we want everyone to get vaccinated that you know that can uh I, I, we realize the hesitancy that some people may have um and we try to address those those hesitancies and one of the best ways that i have found is to sort of do essentially one-on-one -on -one or hold, you know, like town hall meetings. You know, like I've appeared on, you know, numerous podcasts, uh, you know, or uh, uh, social media uh, meetings and, you know, things like this to answer the questions and concerns that people may have. And one of the things that I, I strongly advocate that they do, number one, is get your information from a trusted source. You know, social media can, you know, can send you out into the, you know, the, the, the wild blue yonder. And, you know, and of course, uh, and you're, you're getting nothing but false information. So make sure that your 
information is from a trusted source. And what are those trusted sources that the you CDC would... is a great place. Your state uh, nursing uh, association website, the American Nurses Association website, any of the healthcare organizations uh, websites would be really good trusted information. Others would be to get it from someone like myself. You know, like I participated in the clinical trials, so having been injected with the vaccine, I can tell them what my experience was like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so that, uh, again, you know, it eases their concerns that, uh, you know, that they may have. Uh, for our brothers and sisters in the, you know, the black and brown community where there um, uh, appears to be, um, you know, still a high level of distrust, uh, mainly based on, obviously, their past um, experience, either with the healthcare system or as they look back at, like, the Tuskegee experiment and things of this sort. My answer is that we embrace that, um, you know, what happened. You know, yes, recognize that it happened, but as a result of that, now we have a system in place where you can't do that type of experimentation anymore. You have to go through an institution review board. It has to be reviewed by people. And, um, you know, there are uh, uh, you know, a group of experts who will say, yes, this is, um, uh, you know, this is uh, something that could be done. Uh, you know, without causing harm to, you know, to the individual, or this is going to cause harm, and no, you can't do that. Um, you know, and so, but knowing that, uh, particularly with the, uh, the vaccines, that they have been reviewed by the institution review boards, that they have been um, evaluated by top experts in the, uh, you know, within the field of, uh, of vaccines and et cetera, that should give, uh, you know, uh, put to rest any concerns that people may have. Also, the two, uh, since we, you know, we only have two that are approved right now, both Moderna and Pfizer, they had absolutely no um, access to any of the paperwork or whatever else as people were participating in the clinical trials. Mm. So there was no way that they could manipulate the data or anything else because they had no idea what was going on until everything was, you know, was finalized. And again, it was reviewed by an independent uh, body. So, uh, you know, once people dig in and, and realize that, and realize that, uh, you know, like I participated in the Moderna study. So there was, you know, of the 33,000 people that participated in the, um, the phase three of the uh, Moderna study, about 10,000 of those were African Americans, which is close to about the, you know, the um, uh, representation of the percentage of African American population in the United States. It's actually around 13, 14 percent, mm -hmm. but it's close enough that they can, you know, say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of rumors that, oh, well, they only tried this on, you know, on, on white people. No, there was a, uh, they made certain that there was a, uh, a good mix of all nationalities that were uh, included in these clinical trials, as they do for any clinical trials. Uh, but I think the fact that we have COVID and that a lot of people are paying attention to it right now, you know, those are some of the things that they want to, to look into. But any medication that you take, even if it's a, a Tylenol, it has gone through the exact same process as these vaccines did. And again, there had to be an equal distribution of, uh, you know, of all ethnici ethnicities represented so that we can ensure that you know, it's gonna act the same in, in all populations and not just this way in, in one population or this way in a, another population. Thank you. So tell me this, what are some of the, um, what is a favorite moment that, or moments Mm -hmm. that you can think of as you look back over your career um, or look forward to the future. <laughs> not, you're not, yes. It's not over yet. It's not no, over no. yet, yes. Um, but just some things that just mm -hmm. highlights that stand out in your mind. Those are really great questions. I, 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 there's, there's been so many, it's really hard to, you know, to just <laughs> sort of think of, think of one. But I, I would, would think um, uh, probably one of my uh, most... Um, uh, I, I would say memorable. I wouldn't say that it's favorite, but it's memorable. Mm -hmm. uh, back in 1994, there was the Pope Air Base disaster, and I happened to be charge nurse that day. And I remember picking up the phone and, mm -hmm. you know, getting this excited voice on the, the the other end. But being able to be there, to you know, um, you know, this is one of many disasters that the Burn Center had been able to take, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to absorb and you know and, and get done. But um, being able there to to uh, 
lend my knowledge and expertise that I had for the uh, you know the, the men who had been injured as a, as a result of that. Uh, you know, our, our military guys. That definitely is one that uh, you know that stood out. Um, I think in my role as president uh, of the American Nurses Association, uh, I think one is uh, well, just being the <laughs> being elected the first male. <laughs> Um, and the third African American uh, uh, president of ANA. And ANA actually turns 125 years old wow. this year. So you can see we've got a lot of work to do, <laughs> as I pointed out Three, earlier. Yes. But, uh, but it is, um, you know, recognizing that, uh, you know, that I uh, am blazing the trail for others to follow behind me. So as I mentioned to someone, uh, I'll paraphrase Kamala Harris's words that I may be the first, but I you know, will definitely not be the last. So um, those are, are, are two moments that really stand out. Thank you. Speaking of first, <clears throat> how does it feel to be the first in two different ways? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, one is were you not the first to earn your PhD in nursing from UNCG? Yes. So mm -hmm. you um, did your homework. <laughs> well, I, have yes. some, I have great help with yes. that. But how yes. does that? <clears throat> That feel, and then now to be first as the president. I mean, that uh, you know, to, to to get my PhD, you know, to, to be the first African American male to you know to, to get my PhD from UNC Greensboro, it to me was a, a, a very um, personal and crowning moment. You know, because I, I look back and I'm you know and I uh, I was thinking, you know, here I am just you know five generations removed from slavery. Uh, you know, and to have come this far, uh, you know, to see, um, you know, uh, that my ancestors would have been denied education. Uh, you know, they were not taught to read or write or, you know, or anything else, but to, you know, to recognize that now, you know, here, uh, you know, five generations later, you know, which is just, a, you know, just a hundred years, that, uh, you know, you have gotten the terminal degree from, you know, from, uh, from, from college. Uh, not just a degree, but the terminal degree, um, you know, it's, it's a sense of pride, uh, you know, and I could feel <clears throat> the presence of my ancestors, uh, you know, um, you know, when I got that diploma, yes. you know, in, in my hand. Uh, I, I, being the, the first male president of ANA, um, <clears throat> that's quite a challenge as well, because you know that all eyes are on you. You know that uh, you, know, you have people who are cheering for you and you have people who are you know going to be your distractors as well waiting for you to make a mistake or or what they think of as a mistake um uh, so i i think finding myself in the middle uh you know having uh you know um uh you know constant checks if you will um you know keeps me centered and also my faith keeps me centered and i think that um you know i uh uh, I'm in this position because the man upstairs wants me to be in this <laughs> position, and uh, and I know that uh, you know he's not going to give me too much that I, I can't bear. I mean, what a you know, what a time to be president, right? You got COVID, you got your 125th anniversary. It's the year of the nurse, and you still have an association to run, you know, and realizing that you can't please 4.3 million registered nurses, <laughs> you know, all the same. That's wow. uh, you know that's quite a challenge, but uh, so far. Uh, only my hair is getting grayer, but uh, <laughs> but so well. far, yeah, you know, I'm I'm very uh, you know very pleased with uh, you know with what I have been able to do so far. Um, almost one last question. Mm -hmm. I say almost <laughs> because um, you've been given one of you one of the honorees mm -hmm. that um, Governor Cooper mm -hmm. has so graciously um, provided mm -hmm. for Black History mm -hmm. Month. How do you feel about that being a being one of the exemplars mm -hmm. for excellence in medicine mm -hmm. in the state of North Carolina. I'm really ecstatic by it. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, it's quite an honor to be uh, uh, nominated with the other honorees. Um, you know, I, uh, I still recognize that even though I have done a lot, there's still a lot more to do. And, uh, and it just actually redoubles my effort to you know, to make sure that, uh, you know, my, my work continues. And part of the way that that continues is by inspiring others to, you know, to follow the trail that I have blazed. You know, one of the things that 
I'm a firm believer in is reaching back and, and giving back, mm -hmm. but and, and also you know bringing others forward so that they can make even further progress than what uh, you know what I have done. So, and uh, that's what I, I hope to continue. So, if you're looking for you know what do you want to be your legacy? My legacy is that you know hopefully I blazed a trail so that others it made it easier for others, but that all the citizens of North Carolina are better off because of you know just a little bit of inkling of the work that I did. So now this really is my last question. <laughs> okay. Is there anything that you would like to ask me or any last comments that you would like to make? I, I think, uh, well, first of all, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, you know, to be interviewed, and particularly here at historic uh, you know, Shaw University. Uh, you, you were talking about the, uh, the, the medical school. When you really look at this from a, a global perspective, and the historical perspective as well. You know, every black physician that uh, you know that is practicing today, or you know, or even practiced, you know, years ago, you know, uh, Shaw has had a hand in that. If you stop, you really stop and think about that. And the you know the four HBU medical schools that are you know that are still operating today, it's because of Shaw. You know, and that's something that I think this university should be very proud of. Um, you know, by setting the standard and setting the example and, you know, and others, uh, you know, progressing from that, it's just really amazing. And also the, you know, the fact that, you know, you can point to that history and say that we have made a difference not only here in North Carolina, but around the globe, actually, uh, because obviously one of the things that Shaw and other HBUs have done is that they have ensured that their graduates not only make a difference, you know, within the communities where they serve, but they make that uh, that difference globally, and that's something to be very, very proud of. And you know, I uh, you know I honor that and and treasure that. And you know, for those who are who will be listening to this, I hope that they see that perspective as well. So. Yes, and that is what we do share mm -hmm. is um, a connection through our historically black mm -hmm. colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. That somehow that that was an imprint that happened to yes. us as we progressed in our careers. Yes. So. Dr. Grant, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for spending time with me this mm -hmm. today um, during this this wonderful celebration mm -hmm. of the achievements and the accomplishments mm -hmm. of African Americans, Black folks. Mm -hmm. um, we are pleased that you are one of Governor mm -hmm. Cooper's honorees, and we appreciate you spending the time. With well, us. thank you very much, and delighted to be here.